Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Lineup with Dave Prodan. I'm Dave Prodan, and this is episode 21. A quick note of appreciation for all the listener feedback we've received in recent weeks. It's been really awesome. This podcast is available on all platforms, and we encourage you to download, listen, rate, comment, and subscribe if you like it. It's probably not surprising to hear that the recent feedback has centered a lot around gratitude from people just trying to get through the week or the day during this time. And that's great. That really makes me proud that these conversations are having that kind of an impact. And with that in mind, the COVID-19 notes that we're going to start every show every week until we're through the woods on this pandemic. The CDC's identified symptoms for COVID-19 include runny nose, sore throat, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. If you're not feeling well, call your doctor. The World Health Organization's behavioral recommendations that we all should be following. Wash your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. If you have to cough or sneeze, do so into your elbow. Social distancing. Avoid groups of 10 or more people and stay away from everyone as much as you can. If you're not feeling well, get checked out as soon as possible. And if you can work from home, do it. All right. Have you been watching the WSL Vault and Rewind shows yet? Every Monday on WorldSurfLeague.com, the WSL Vault releases a highlight show from the Audis. And every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the WSL Rewind replays an entire event. Yesterday's Vault release features the 2001 Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, where a 19-year-old wildcard named Mick Fanning fired shots across the bows of the world's best surfers, the waves pumped, and the performances are really impressive. And pairing with The Vault is this week's Rewind, which will be playing the 2015 Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, a bookend of sorts for the Mick Fanning Bells podium saga, and definitely worth a watch. Both shows are playing on worldsurfleague.com. Do not miss them. So Bells Beach is the order of the week, a sacred place to Australia's original landholders, with the Wadharong people considering it one of their song lines or dreaming tracks. And our guest today, while not Australian, is someone who holds the same reverence for Bell's Beach and, over the past 15 years, has become a huge part of its story. Our guest today came up in a time before the Brazilian storm, where he battled titans like Andy, Joel, Mick, Taj, Kelly, and others, largely on his own. He first lit up the international stage with a win at the 2003 ASP World Junior Championships, then followed it up by winning the 2005 qualifying series, before going to work amongst the elite, where he remains today. Seven elite championship tour victories and the 2015 world title. Please enjoy the lineup's low tide conversation with Adriano D'Souza. The good old clap, take one. That's right. <laughs> How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did, I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put him up once, let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave, get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. It's up here, boxing. <laughs> All right, so today we've got 2015 world champion Adriano D'Souza joining the lineup podcast for another Low Tide edition, which is what we're calling these during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this also gives us space to bring you back for a full lineup in the future. So surreal times right now. Where are you today, Adriana? I am in home, Florianopolis. And um, yes, it was kind of hard times we going through now, uh, especially we don't have a date. That's uh, pretty much we most worry about it, you know, when this is all be done. And, um, but uh, for me, I wake up every day and, and waiting for patient for some answer. Um, when this is, is gonna be down and uh, we moving forward. Yeah, it's really, it's really bizarre because it's for, from my personal perspective, it was one of those things where you kind of knew it was happening and then it started to happen and you, you're like, well, maybe it'll be like a week or two weeks or some places we can't go and then before you know it, everyone's in isolation and self-quarantining. And, and as you said, 
the alarming thing is we don't know. We don't know if it's going to be a month or six months or two years, and it's yeah. it, it's a really uncertain time. Are you mm-hmm. are you still surfing? Are you going to the beach and able to surf mm-hmm. right now? No, where I live, it's uh, it's been shut down the last two weeks, and uh, we isolate as well, and um, it's been really tough because um, as soon as I uh, arrive from Australia, I have to be in quarantine for two weeks before I see the parents. You know. Wow. What 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 was that like? Do they they hold you in a a hotel or someplace or no i back i, I back home but um but my parents live uh, a little bit far mm-hmm. but um but i can't can't see them at this stage you know i thought right. i thought right after my quarantine time i can see them but uh but as soon as the news is coming by every day and then it's for me it was a stay more away for them you know so I just talk by them by the phone and but it's not the same, you know. I just my dad my dad if had already a lots of um uh breathing problems because he'd been smoking for the last forty years. And uh if man, if he got that disease for sure he doesn't have that much power to to go against, you know, so we are uh, really worried about it, but uh, pray every day and then he not out of his home for the last two weeks. So, but uh, here in Brazil, the, everything coming a little late compared mm-hmm. with the world and uh, especially US as well. And then they are kind of like coming from the, the China and then Europe and then U.S. and then now Brazil starting to get a lot of case, but uh, I just felt like uh, Brazil was kind of like late about this process, mm. so probably would take more time for me to normally uh, back to the real life, you know. So yeah, it's one of those compare, things that it, it's rolling US and rolling. The, the whole yeah. world, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard with the parents. My my dad's been sick for a while, and I was going down there every week. And now I can't, you know, because I don't I don't want to carry it down there. And you know, I've got kids; they may have it, I may have it. And it's it's one of those things. But as you said, it's not the same talking on the phone as being there in person. But yeah. do you have any tips? You're not able to surf. How you've been spending your days? Or any tips to help people get through quarantine right now? Um, basically, I've been I I have a little gym in my in my house, you know. So I have some tools I've been using every day, and then I have a preparation. I do trainings like in the part of the morning and at night as well, and during the day. And also, I do some stuff in in my home as well to care about the house and then cooking and then and do some. Um, some like stuff in my home to organizing and with my wife and uh yeah beside that we i just live uh front off of the beach i see the waves every single day and uh, i can surf that's uh towards a little bit but um but uh, yeah it just uh i felt it is a part we need to go against and then I hope I can see the lights at the end of the tunnel. Well, on the topic of those lights, you know, this week at the WSL is is Bell's Beach Week. This is the week that we would have been there and that's going to be the topic that you and I are really sinking our teeth into today because that is a very special place in the surfing world and and you are a very special part of, of that venue story. But to start up, in recent years, the, the Brazilian storm has really overtaken the surfing world, but they didn't come out of nowhere. Brazilians have been competing against the world's best surfers since the tour's inception in 1976. And in the years leading up to Gabrielle's historic 2014 world title, which was Brazil's first, you know, doors were busted down and pathways were forged. And you really swung a bigger ax than anyone. You were the 2003 ASP World Junior Champion. You were the 2005 QS winner, <laughs> and the winner of uh, multiple CT events. So, 
How do you view your role as it pertains to the Brazilian storm? Because you came a little bit before the, the big group. Yes, uh, basically that name, Brazilian storm, the original doesn't start with me. You know, they started with uh, one of these pack of uh, junior uh, surfers was Gabriel, Miguel, Alejo, Jadson, and uh, what else? Alejo. And all these guys, these five guys was the same pretty much age. And then starting coming really strong on the junior events and uh, especially on the Huntington Beach. I remember was that kind of event, that name coming alive. Oh, the Brazilian storm, you know. So because we had uh, five guys, they are like tacky in the quarterfinal. And uh, they are match each other. And then like that event was pretty much that the people overseas, they starting to see these guys coming to rock, you know. Mm. And uh, I am already on the tour fighting against the best, but like mm. my path was a little harder because I I took Mick, Joe, Andy, and Kelly on the highest you can get, you know. So yeah. it was way difficult for for myself to to like showing up against those guys. They're already shiny, you know. On uh, on a championship, and uh, but I was on a way. I was like, I was trying to um, progression to the world title it was not that easy, like people thinking. You know, it is. You need to be amazing on a ten foot, amazing on a six foot, amazing on a two foot, amazing on every kind of conditions to be a world champion. So every year. Since uh, 2006, when I jump on tour, I realize all this weakness of myself and mm. uh, starting working and um, and definitely took me a uh, four years to win my first um, um, event it was right. in Mondaka. Yep. So yeah, that's kind of like the way you know. People back in the day think about of surfing, you know. Oh man, the first two years you need to learn all these kind of wall, you know. Uh, back in the day, uh, already no exist, you know. Everyone jump on to the want to win already the world title. Mm. So, and uh, it's very different compared when I jump on tour, you know. The the, the thoughts. At about uh, surfing, especially on the CT, but uh, but I think uh, these five guys they are they are rocking the world, you know, pretty much, and uh, already there. So people trying to mix me with this group, but I but I felt I am not part of that group, you know. I'm just like older than them. But uh, but I just realized those guys needed the, the lights and then and then deserve it, you know, because um, I see we are on the highest as you can get, but I don't see the junior guys from Brazil doesn't have that force used to be, you know. Yeah, well, two guys they they are doing really good now. It is Samuel and then Mateus. Compare Alejo, Miguel, Gabriel, now Italo. So we have uh, more athletes with the level to be a top top five, you know. So we are in a process now uh, going up and then down, but this is normal. It's every country like US, Australia. So all the learn like those lines, you know, and then we are now took over those lines, American and Australian it was dominating the, the world tour for so long. But um, yeah, this is uh, the time we, uh, we on top, but uh, I just hope we are doing a good job. Well, and I think 
part of that is that, you know, without you being there before and without you accomplishing what you did, there is no Brazilian storm because you really cleared a lot of the pathway for them. I was talking to the, the Lipped podcast guys about this last week and you came up and we were discussing the potential like psychological weight that you had to carry in the mid to late 2000s in terms of championing Brazil before the surfing world really began to pay their respects. And you and a few of your other countrymen on tour at that time, as you said, only had a fraction of the support that people have today. Um, and while you obviously benefited from Brazilians that came before you, you, you were there for a lot of firsts, you know, first Brazilian to win the Pipe Masters, first Brazilian to win Portugal and the Margaret River CT, and as you said, Mundaka. Can you talk to us a little bit more about being kind of at the pointy end of the spear and challenging the world's best by winning CT events, challenging Kelly Slater in his 2010 10 world title year? And I guess the thought that before you won your world title in 2015, did you ever think that your role could have been, I cleared the way for Gabrielle to win, I'm not going to win? Was that ever a concern for you? No, I think uh, just back to the beginning, I think um, my path during these 15 years now, I'm going to complete this year 15 years on a world tour. I think it was more natural, you know, compared was today, because I think today uh, the, the young athlete doesn't have that much uh, walls, you know, to be against, you know. So I think... Um, when I when I saw my was my aspiration was uh, Victor Ribas and Fabio Gouveia, and then those guys was my mirror, and uh, does those guys was a champion, but a dozen was a champion was athletes we have it today, so we have a better example, you have a better ideas and better surfing, and then. That's a, pretty much the progression, you know? So I think Fabio took like 10 or eight years to win his first uh, world title, uh, first uh, world event on a CT. My reduced for four years and then Gabriel took only a few months. And then that's pretty much the progression. And uh, I believe what example we have today Surfers from Brazil have a more potentially to bust in the door more easily, you know. Mm. And uh, special, we have a bunch of title and a juniors, and um, and also we have a three titles on a, on the men's WCT. And uh, I believe uh, the guys starting the journey now where it is more easier and I have uh, so much support and investment as well to make these athletes better. So I pretty much, I was the first athlete from Brazil to have uh, those support, you know, because the example of Fabio and then Victor doesn't have uh, their support in the beginning. They are, they are very uh, uh, aggressive and then, I have to do everything I can because if you are not got the heat today, I don't have pretty much money to coming back home, you know? Mm -hmm. So back in the day, it was kind of like this example. And then as soon as I jump on tour, it was totally different. I have support and money, I invest on my surfing, invest on my equipment. And, and that's pretty much was the change, the page, of the Brazilian on a world tour. And I think for me, 2015 was put all the years together, was fighting for the world title. The, all these years I, I was on the world tour, was I learning every single year, especially with Kelly. I think Kelly was my master, you know, and uh, I use him and Mick Fanny example from day one. You know, I using those two guys was my, my, my pillar. You know, these guys for me, it is my example. I have to follow them, and um, yeah, that's what I did. And and I, I, I'm really happy to 
to put all together on that year 2015 and uh, bring that trophy to home. Yeah, and you mentioned something that, that came up in the conversation with Mick too. You talked about when you qualified, you, you felt like there were a lot of pieces of your surfing that you had to work on and improve um, before you could win events, before you could challenge for world titles. And when we were talking to Mick, it surprised me too because he said the same thing. He said, I look, it wasn't for multiple years that I, I, I believed that I could win, you know, like, and both of you were very well hyped by the surf industry and the media when you qualified. Mick obviously was, but I remember when you won the, uh, the 2003 ASP World Junior Championships and just blew everyone out of the water. Then you won the QS in 2005 and, and the world seemed very, very ready to see you win right away. But can you talk to us a little bit about what parts of your surfing did you work on after you qualified for the CT and, and, and how did that kind of mold you into the surfer that began winning events and, and, and ultimately winning the world title? Yeah, basically when I, I remember like clear, like when I jump on a world tour in 2006, I have to modify my surfing because I was more radical. I was more like fast and, uh, and then as soon as I jump in a world tour, I saw my style, my type of surfing doesn't work well. I doesn't receive good scores. Mm. And then was more carving, was more power. And I remember like those guys on the top of the rankings was Mick, was Joe, was Phil Maka, and then Kelly. Those guys was was not a doesn't have that doesn't have that much ability on uh, on the air. Mm -hmm. And I say, man, I do everything here, but it doesn't go well. So I have to modify everything. So I spend more time, especially on uh, Gold Coast, um, to clear my surfing pretty much, you know? So I using a lot of uh, Australia was my background to, because it was a lot of right-handers. So just to wor work on my rail and then all my equipment to get in close of those guys, you know, and then Andy was kind of those guys have a mix of power and then radical and then and an amazing ability on the big waves. So he was kind of like out of this group I'm talking about, you know, and um, but I use those guys you know, my reference. And then as soon as I went first time to Tahiti, um, I remember I couldn't, I couldn't surf because it was a totally different uh, perspective. I've been surfing and I've uh, been used to. And uh, that was my first time I watched the mirror and I say, man, I have a lot of to work on this type of waves. And then that's the start of my journey, you know. I spend more time there. And uh, Andy was, Andy and Kelly was those guys who were spending more time after the event because I, I stayed to, to learn my, my surfing. And I watching those guys there after the event was, man, looking at those guys. They are amazing. They are they're doing great job on those waves and they're still here learning and, and practice. So this is kind of example I have to, to follow, you know, so. I remember and, that I, being a really big deal. Like, like you talked about being a very radical surfer when you qualified and you were like, I remember watching you essentially won the world juniors with aerials and you were, you were a really progressive aerialist on tour. Do you think if you qualified 10 years later and the way the judging criteria had evolved that you would have been more rewarded like 10 years later? Do you think you're of a little course. ahead of your time? Yeah. Of course. So I have to remodel my surfing, you know? Right. So yeah. <laughs> you got to go backwards. But I need to. back, Not backwards, but like it is remodeling because the, the, the type of uh, waves we have yeah. on the world tour was, was more classic surfing, you know, like J-Bay or... Mm. A snapper and then bells. We don't see much uh, air on those type waves, especially today we see because this new generation bring a new surfing 
Um, and then everyone now following this new surfing. But back in the day when I jumped on tour, was I, I was a little bit ahead of of surfing on, on the air, kind of. But uh, but even Jordy and then Julia, when I jump on tour, I have to remodel as well. Yeah. So I'll, not only myself, you know, but uh, I think the criteria change. And then, and for me, well, that's been a, that's been a conversation for the last few years. When you know, when people are looking at kind of the modern Brazilian storm and all the aerials, and then they reference you and they say, "Well, you know, he's more of a power surfer, etc." And I think I've been around long enough. I'm like, he has an awesome air game. He, he's just yeah. like he was a, that he was an air guy before a, a power guy. And and we talked about you being the first Brazilian to do a lot of things. And, and you were the first Brazilian male, um, like shout out to Silvana Lima who won the, uh, the women's event in 2009, but you were the first Brazilian male to win the Bell's Beach event, which you did in 2013. Can you, can you talk to us about your relationship with Bell's Beach and, and what it meant to, to win there in 2013? Yeah, I, that's what I say to you at the beginning, like Australia for me was my background, you know? So I use Australia country, to my home, you know? So if you see my history on a country, like the only one event I know won, I didn't won was Snapper. Because if you see Newcastle, I won. Uh, Sydney, I won as well. I won Bells, I won Margaret's, and I had, I think three or two finals in Snapper. I think that qualifies you to be close, an Australian you know? citizen. And, and also I won the ju- the juniors in, in Arabian. So I use that country, um, my background, you know, and uh, and I spend so much time even today because this year in 2020, the first January, I jumped in, a, in a, an airplane. I went to Australia to spend two, three months. Mm-hmm. So... I use the countries a lot, you know, so the wave is amazing. The country and, and, and everything around Australia for me, I felt amazing, you know, and I have a great friend. So it makes me feel great, you know, so, you know, so I have an amazing a level of surfing as well. Every time you hit the water, you see four or five or six guys pushing the limit every single time you're surfing so it's it's amazing when mm. i when i surf in home usual here from top of my house it's only myself you know so i surfing but uh, not like the the potential if i surf against somebody doing great surfing next to me so mm. um and then that's why australia for me i spend so much time and then bells and um I doesn't spend much time in Margaret because it was most the last event of the the season and everyone kind of tired and especially myself. I spent like two months before the first event started. So as soon as we hit in Margaret, uh, for me, it was kind of like, man, I'm exhausted, you know, so I need to refresh and because the year just started, you know, so. Yeah. But, uh, but for me, Australia, it is one of the, like one of the plays I have so much respect and, and, and give it to my surfing so much. And, you know, all the events on tour are really special and they have their own identity and, and, but, but it seems that collectively a couple of them are, are a little bit tiered up, you know, and, and I think that bells is one of those, it's the longest running event and people like to say no kook has ever rung the bell. It has all this <laughs> history and heritage is, is that venue special to you, like maybe more so than the other spaces? And then talk us through what it meant to win like that in uh, 2013. Man, for me, for me to to be on a on a list, you know, to the Bells champions. Uh, every every year for me, Bells for me was not an event. For me, it is a celebration of surfing. That's pretty much uh, that feeling. When I see my ticket and I see Melbourne, you know, I say, man, I'm going to celebration surfing because that event has been running for so long, you know, and uh, it's not easy to see so much history, you know, on, on the same, on only one wave, you know. And uh, that's why I spend so much time there and uh, after the event, before the event, 
this year I went already to as well in Bells to surf in practice and, and see everyone there. So I just try to bring the energy, you know, like, man, I'm here just surfing and, and get used to all these vibes, you know. So that's what I use a lot, um, most of the events I can. Hmm. But a Bells for me, is, it is special, you know. And uh, to, to the way I won was incredible, you know, to get Mick on the quarterfinal was one of the most heroes, an I, I, icon surfing on, on Bells. Mm. And, uh, and took him down on a quarterfinal, make me really like, okay, that's it, you know, that's the time. I just took him, Mick, he one of the best on this wave and then his connection with this wave, it is incredible. And uh, I think uh, I have the potential to make this day my favor, you know, and uh, and then on the same as I, I remember, I, I I got a Josh, Josh Kerr. He was doing a crazy airs in that day because it was kind of like onshore, the the, the onshore kind of t- time to play, and was like, man, it would be difficult. But uh, if I concentrate him on the sets waves, uh, I think I have an advantage of my side. And everything coming to my, my side as well, I guess. And then and the waves are scanning junky again. And then Nat Young was he was the underdog and took him down a lot of great athletes on the way as well. And I say I think the final it is the match, two guys is being a great connection during the day, you know, and then I say Let's keep in pray for this connection to be my side. And uh, yeah, that's it. That I, I took the best wage from that at the final and uh, yeah, stuck to to win. And you know, 2013, it, it wasn't a fluke. You were a consistent performer out there, including in this week's episode of the Rewind, and including in this week's episode of the Rewind on WorldSurfLeague.com, which will be the 2015 event and now for our lineup segment of the rear view you and i are going to watch your round four battle against kelly slater and josh kerr yep all right so here we are this is round four 2015 against kelly and kersey you are jersey number 13 why did you pick number 13 yeah a lot of reason i have uh, with the number 13 um the code of my city the number, it is 13. And uh, the day I born was 13. <laughs> and uh, my wife born on the 13th of September. All right. And uh, yeah, and also the first event I won in the CT was uh, October 13 as well. So with a lot of confidence, I think this is the my number. <laughs> I, I like it. So, so you're 28 years old here. You're ranked third heading into Bells. All that attention yeah. is probably on Gabrielle, who won the title last year. What are your thoughts on Kelly and Josh Kerr as competitors out of Bells? Basically, I remember this heat was like round four already, and, and mm-hmm. we have a pass. The round two, for me, the round two was crazy. It was, I think, my perspective, the, the heat, the hardest heat I have on this event was against CJ. Mm. And um, yeah, CJ was a uh, low seed in the moment. And that time, I was kind of like the high seed because of snapper event. Mm-hmm. I got third, and uh, and we match on a good waves quality, and uh, yeah, the heat started, and um, yeah, I got I, I think I remember I started with a seven, and he started with a seven. By like five minutes left of the heat, he he got like a eight point five, and it was like, damn, and a die second, like a die second, like it's ten seconds remaining. I look into the ocean and I say, please give me something. <laughs> and there was not a set wave, you know? And uh, the, the only wave I saw was like, this is the only chance. And, uh, and I say, I need an 8.5. I say, man, I need to do something really big 
to make this go happen, you know? And, um, and I did three great turns out the back and then one in the, at, the, at, at the inside. And uh, I was very angry because I thought my scores was not um, receive award. I used, I, that's what I, I thought in that moment. <laughs> and I think, I think, man, if I lose here, I think my whole project in my mind, it was sh- shut down, you know, to, yeah. to, to study well in Australia. That was my plan back in the day, you know. And when I beat CJ on the round two, everything got really clean and, and I really confidence. And in round three, I passed him by. And round four for me was already bonus, you know. So it was right. very, like... This is my time, you know. So yeah, that pressure. Then, you probably had yeah. so much pressure on yourself having done well on the Gold Coast that you don't want to lose right away at Bells. And by the time you get here, you're feeling good. And yeah, of course. And then that heat it was very, like, concentrating, but like lighter, you know, without right. that weight, that weight in my shoulder, you know. Yeah, and I guess then, at this point you already kind of have a pretty good result, right? Yeah, but, yeah but we don't yeah. do we. And we don't do non-elimination round four anymore. Did was it kind of like light? You know, there wasn't really any consequence. Here goes Kelly. I think at oh, that wow. point for me, I was not thinking about. It. I just want to be in the quarters, you know, no matter right. what, you know. So, and 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 that he especially, I was starting Kelly and then Josh. They are like not being on amazing ability during the event, you know? So right. oh, okay. Kelly was like, oh, two five, two six. So, you know, Josh was kind of the same. I say, I am doing a good job during this, this event, you know? I was doing eights, I doing nines, and I say, I have to bring in this, this kind of performance to this heat, you know? So that was my concentration before the heat started. And then, and I say, before the heat started, I say, I have to take the nine. If I'm not take the nine, I'm going to lose. And I have to, I will jump to the round five. So it was kind of my focus of the heat was that, like, I have to take the, pick the wave. And I have to be really like surgery, like against Kelly, I can miss an opportunity against Josh. He's a, such a dangerous athlete. So, and I say, I have to pick the right ones, you know? So I think that he, I starting not that amazing, where we see now, it is yep. one wave, was just to make scores, you know? Yeah, and I you, have to put you, something were, you on had the, the board, inside you know? against Kelly on this wave too. Did you intentionally try to, try to get the inside of him at the start of the heat? Did it not matter? Or were you just looking for the best wave? I think Kelly starting one wave. I think I got the priority in that moment. So I started right. with priority. I say god. my strategy before the heat is going good, you know? So <laughs> Josh is starting like with a five and a oh, six a and turn. Kelly was a three. I say everything go the flow. Let's let's go. Keep it rolling. And then I think I got a six five at the start. And then it was better than them. And I when I back to the lineup with a jet ski and I saw Josh got a one on the inside. And I say, if Skelly missing opportunity, I think I gonna I need to to concentrate on the on the on the best heat of the day, on the heat, you know? Right. So that's a huge finger then, from Kelly. Yeah, that's the that's a wave he got it when I, right before I I jumped to the outside. Yeah. And he, he looks uh, like he's on a shorter board too. Like this it looks kind of short. That, that bells was, do you right shorter that longer. That was equipment. yeah, I remember that was the time Kelly would ju- try to change the equipment, you mm. know? And that was a between the transition. So people back in that time we are not get like um, how I can say, like, we are not believing. I think the, the tour doesn't believe if we're going shorter, right? We, we'll be better for your surfing. But right. usually Kelly is always in front, but sometimes works <laughs> or sometimes doesn't. So that's the kind of like people and special for judging doesn't 
give you that credit for him, you know? So, and then, and especially for Bells, we, we, you need something you can cut all those chop, you know? Yeah. To make the turn uh, harder. Mm. So he, he has like a small board. So he needs to do something out of, out of the box to making this course. So yeah. for him, and, make and it, it even harder, you know? And it seems like one of those waves where you have to delicately balance like progressive surfing and then kind of traditional rail-based surfing because even someone like Josh, you wouldn't think that Bells would be a successful spot for him, but he was able to kind of make it work a lot yep. of times. Yep. Um, so you guys have got a lull here. Do you guys talk like when you're sitting no, out there? No, never. In between waves? never. never? I, I am those guys. I don't like to talk. Doesn't matter who. It's not if it's like if, if it's if the other athletes starting to talk, I just shut down. You know, I just be quiet and 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 keeping leasing my mind. You know, because I I always talk with my mind during the during the process, the heat, because everything I analyzing and then mentally before the heat, I keeping talking to myself. You know. Mm. And then believe, believe in what you're thinking, believe in what you plan, and you know, because it's so easy to make you out of the track during the heat, especially like someone got eight or nine that make you, make you, trying to make you out of your track, you know, if you right. out of your track, it will be more easy to like make a mistake or go some way if you don't want it to go, you know, so... That's um, that's something I've been I've been learning with myself, and uh, I think that make my quality um, on a strategy of heat, you know. And, who's who's uh, the worst guy out there who tries to talk to you and take you out of your game? Kelly, you want to know those guys? <laughs> Kelly, what, what does he Joe, say? What's been something he said to you? Usual, usual, like, oh fucking. What is what's going on out there? Look in the look in the mirror. Look in the <laughs> <laughs> just a, any any point of distraction. Yeah, like. yeah. And look at what is this guy doing? And then like <laughs> you know. So I just I I thinking it's part of his game. I respect. Sure. He doesn't but think I, so, he, though. He'd just be like, oh, I'm just being friendly. I don't know why people think I'm playing head games. <laughs> but it's, just like, yeah, dude. but sometimes, sometimes it could be, could be uh, true or could be not. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He loves, he, I mean, he loves playing in that space. Like the, everything's burning next to you and then people starting to talk. <laughs> so... <laughs> And uh, that's kind of those those tricky or not um, doing that process. I I wanted to keep my game, you know, alive. Yeah. So and we we and, talked uh, about it before. I mean, you you were really one of the only guys that challenged Kelly for a lot of years. Like a lot of people like to lay down, you know. Especially I remember vividly 2010 when he was going for 10 world titles in 2010. You and him butted heads in competition a lot, yeah. you know, in yeah. Puerto Rico and other places. What was your relationship like with him, in, in, you know, at this event, at this stage of your career? Um, yeah, I, th I, I think back in the day was kind of, I am those kind of underdog, you know. So Kelly and then Taj, Mick, was, those guys was fighting for the world title, you know. And uh, for them, the pressure was uh, way higher and then... They have to win. They have to be on the finals. And then myself, I want to like to show them I am. I'm here to not make a joke, to not make you my friend. You know, I wanted mm. to beat you guys. <laughs> you know, so it was kind of like to proving not only the athletes but the whole scenario next to me, the event. It's it's, it's so hard, like to to you to walking down the event and and see everyone watching and making news about who is the favorite to win this contest and right. never see your name yeah you know during this well, and the it, last it's a, 
it's a subjectively scored sport, right? So all of that course. matters, whether it's the media or the fans or the industry or your competitors. Like you said, you almost had to challenge them just to get a seat at the table and then challenge for a world title because you have to make people believe that you belong in that conversation. Of course, and make and making believe, people believe why you do. You know, mm-hmm. that's pretty much the main thing, you know. And uh, I, I know these guys have a... De- they all deserve, you know, to to be on the top of the list, and and they are amazing athletes. But we are thirty six guys, you know, fighting for the same spot. So right. for me, back in the day, it was kind of like, hey, I'm here to win, you know. So and then for me, it was 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 harder because of I have so much walls to making through, special yeah. those tips like oh you never why you never get a great result here oh you make it quarters now amazing <laughs> most of the interviews was like that you know like they're surprised oh, man yeah. wow you make it quarters you know i was like Ugh. no I'm, I'm not here to make a quarter i want to win this thing you know yeah so so, so you're up here kind of like challenging you know i making through the years but uh i think uh, i did put it well oh <laughs> unquestionably but as you said like not everyone has as many barriers they have to get through. And some of those barriers are racial and some of those barriers are cultural and some of those barriers are systemic. And you had a lot that you had to barrel through in terms of your career. Um, You know, and you probably still are. I mean, as you said, this is 15 years on tour and you're still challenging for events and world titles. So, So at this point in the heat, you took a little smaller wave. I think this pulls you ahead, but you looked a little bit frustrated. You know, in slow heats like this, the, at some point, do you flip a switch and you say, look, I just got to get some more scores. I want to put the pressure back on them and, and get out in the lead. Yes. Um, basically, in that time, uh, I, Kelly got the priority and also have the highest score of the heat. You know, he got mm-hmm. an 8.5 and I, I, and I got a 7.83. And uh, I say, I need to make in two scores before... Because Kelly already got the priority, so he had the potential to select the best wave. So I think I'm gonna. I have something. I, I'm gonna take some wave to to see if the small ones can offer something to me. Mm. And that's what I play in that 3.33. You see, it was kind of like under, and then under off Kelly and then Josh. Yeah. But um. But what the are you wave doing here was kind of. Are, yeah. are you pissed? Are you happy? Are you pissed? What's going on? No, I was pissed because I, I think Bell's it is rhythm. Mm. I missing the first way. I think I missing the first turn and I missing everything. So that's why I kind of like pissed. I think I I I think I was. I can make a five or five five in that wave, and I and I got a three point three three. Right. And then back in that time, specifically, was a high tide. So I was a tincher as well with the high tide. Maybe was not two sets to finish the heat or, or one. So it can, it can play, you know. And then that's why I took that little one. And, uh, but I was only 13 minutes left. You see, it was, we are... Uh, on the high tide in that moment. And I say, I am in the lead, okay. But uh, Josh and then Kelly need only small scores, you know, so, so. This looks like Kelly's first wave again. So are you guys kind of over in the bowl or are you closer up to Rincon we, because it's high tide? We are on the bowl in that time. I think I've the, always the thought tide. The, I mean, the bowl seems so tricky to me. Like there's just, you know, it's hard to find the waves. Like Rincon's slower, but it's it's a little bit more straightforward and let you kind of know what you're getting. But the bowl, especially on those high tide ones where you're not sure where to sit, is it can be tricky. Yeah, I think I think Bells it is or or you love or you hate. Doesn't have a mix, doesn't have a between. I, I love the bowl, you know, so and uh and I make that thing works for my side, you know? So right. I love when the contest on, on the ball, you know, making me really confident. And I hate when I go to Rincon and, uh, I, I enjoy 
a lot when I go to Winky Pot. But right. um, yeah. but when I come running on a ball, I, I already in, inside of myself I was like yes, yes, that's uh, all I that's all I want, you know. All right, so and there's 12, 12 that, minutes left, and you get a set coming. Kelly's yeah. got priority. Let's see here. You looked at that wave. That's the that's the main point of the heat now. Right. That's, it's almost it's almost a wash at this point. Yeah. So, so Kelly's going on this wave. He kind of didn't need to. Do you think this was a no, smart he decision? He need because that's what I'm talking about. There's a set wave, and he got mm. priority. Joshua next to him. He would have. He got a five. So. That's all kind of play to your side, you know? Right. And that's and, that ri uh, the rhythm that you were talking about. Yeah. And then, and then Josh definitely coming in and set the next one because usual bells only run only a few ways per set. Mm. Oh, no, this is and you. That's me because I think Josh going in the first oh, one. Oh, my God. <laughs> the size of that turn. Yeah. This must be a big one. Wow. That's the wave. That's the wave I always was dreaming for during the heat, you know? Yeah. And, and what, then, what makes this wave kind of a better scoring opportunity than Kelly's? Because Kelly's was a little bumpier. He was kind of too far out in the face. And you look like you came from behind and really hooked into that first section. Yeah, I think what happened is, especially on the high tide there, the first wave of the set was kind of like mushy and a lot of bumpies. Mm. The second one, usual, usual, it is the better wave. Right. But uh, somehow in that time going three waves, you know, and then looking of Josh waves was kind of like more wall compared with, uh, with the Kelly's one. He's and my again. one was running amazing on a bank, you know? Yeah. So, oh, man. And what, I started. What board model well. are you riding here? What, which model do you remember? I was rookie. I remember rookie. it was a rookie and uh, was a 5'11. And you've worked with a few shapers in your career. I think you know, Pukash and maybe Timmy Patterson and maybe a DH in there at one point. DH is um, exactly. And then Channel Islands? And, and now China Chile? Islands, yeah. Yep. China Islands was always my dream, you know, to make part of the team because Kelly was 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 the team, you know. So I say, man, this guy, it is my reference. And uh, and uh, one of the things that was uh, making me attention about equipment was Kelly only surf with Americs all any kind of type conditions mm. for big or small or huge and then the rest of the athletes have to change especially in hawaii i have right. to change the shapes and then so that's what's making me really like uh more connecting with the uh, china island surfboards and then but also before and the juniors are riding as well uh chilies mm. on the juniors when i was a juniors Oh, right. And then okay. and then now I move into Chile support. So, do you think it's in it's important to work with one shaper at a time? Because sometimes there's years where you see. I remember like Jordy and Julian for a few years. They worked with a bunch of shapers, and it it felt like their performances were up and down. Um, do, do you think that while you can change shapers throughout the years, it's important to kind of focus in in all conditions with a shaper for a season or another season? I think every athlete have your own uh, mentality of, mm. about surfboards, you know. My one, I, I give a lot of credit of surfboard because it's a handmade, you know. So when it's handmade, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long process to make one surfboard, you know. It all depends on temperature, depends uh, the blank quality, depends on um, how you finish the board. And um, I give so much credit and pay attention, analyzing as well the process, because some some part of the year, I think my board's working really well, and some part of the year it doesn't. Mm. But I usual if you pay attention, because the weather's change as well. The weather's change, and that changes and the the flex and all the and composition. The it's crazy how many variables the, that go in. Everything's it. change. Yeah. That's why this process, I starting more attention, and then realizing, 
and they say, I think usual my boards was was the first six months of the year was amazing because the most was doing in America and in America at the first six months was cold and you know mm. the weather was kind of like playing and the summer the board was doesn't go well it was kind of like right was nasty pretty fast you know yeah so right. you can That's interesting crashing the board really easy so I uh, realizing the hot and the and the temperature was warming affect a lot of my surfboards and uh and then that's why I was kind of like changing something during this last six months to make the mm. board a little harder mm. and then and talk with a lot of with the shape who is making the board and give the good feedback. When you have a lot of shaping doing your boards, mm. it make it even harder for you to have that connection to yeah. make this amazing surfboard during the whole year. Probably when you have a lot of shapers, it's easy you have a random of good surfboards, right. but an, on a long process, make you harder to have a good surfboard. So, and you guys are competing at and performing at such a high level every heat that like it feels like the minimizing of those variables is so important because. You know, I even talk to guys who are like, I, I don't, I can't ride like a fish just for fun. Like I have to be really in tune with my board every time for com competition. Is that something that you do too? Do you ever take out fun shapes? Or yes, is it just I, I am the same. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a fish support in my, in my lock. Uh, I am, I, I, I feel like my surf, I have connection with surfboard. It is exactly the same as a Formula One. Mm. You have to work in really deep on your car and the curve. Right. Who is going faster? It is the winner. And then I think on a surfboard, it is exactly the same. You know, if you work in really close in tune with your equipment, that's make you faster. That make mm. you have the advantage compared with another athlete. So... We work in the little details, and then that's why I ha I don't have a time to be fun on the on the fish and then play around. Uh, those time I'm not on a heat. I'm working really deeply in every single detail of my surfing and also on my surfboard. I, I think that Formula One comparison is dead on. Like everything is so precision focused and. You know, it pays off, right? Last um, wave you got was a 963. It's the highest of the heat. Heat's winding down. Kelly needs a nine. Like, are you still nervous? There's four minutes. So do you, or are you, you're sitting pretty. You've got priority. Yeah, that's why the last five minutes I got priority. And then Kelly also um, missing his priority on, on the wave was not that great. Mm. So I was kind of like, you know, happy. <laughs> with that playing on his mind because that's a I told I told you before the high tide make you think about that 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 kind of like man I need to I need to work I need to work before the tide was playing you know so and then Kelly has a five so make him kind of like man I'm so close you know to win and as you Doing said, he hadn't heat, been you know? scoring that high that event. That might be one of the higher waves he'd scored. So maybe his confidence had picked back up a bit and he believed that he could go out there and manufacture a score like yeah. he's done so many times in his career. Yeah, of course. But uh, but I'm specifically that what that he you see he was kinda like play around and then go next to me and then do some turns and go back, you know. So he always he always like have the ability to take a small wave and then took that advantage because he type of surfing helps him to get those scores, you know? So especially when you need like a nine, okay. I think the wave have to help you to get the score, mm. but some athletes doesn't need to, you know? So, and then I put Kelly on another type of athletes. 
And he's, uh, so this is 2015. So he won his uh, 11th world title in 2011. He finished runner up in 2012. He finished runner up again in 2013. He's still very much at this point considered a world title threat, obviously. What about in 2020? Do you consider him world title threat? No, I think he on the different vibes, you know? Mm. And then I think um, even myself, I I don't want to put myself on a title contender, you know? So because I, my vibes at this stage, I'm just backing on, on the hardest year of my entire life. I spent a year long, like on the chair, on the table doing physio. Right. And then, and then next year, say I'm gonna win the world title. <laughs> so that's that. That's the the vibe I don't wanna put in myself. You know, I just wanna like back on my performance. I wanna see myself in doing nines. I wanna see see my my confidence and building on that kind of stuff. You know, when you have those tools, okay, now I can go to the world title. But it is a step, you know? So it It's is almost steps. like you were earlier in your career too, right? Where you have to build yourself into that conversation. Of course, it is a step-by-step, yeah. step, you know? I don't want to like jumping because yeah. the year is such a long year, yeah. you know? And then, uh, and I think Kelly, he, he's on tour, but like he wanted just to prove he is amazing. He's like, you know, he it's has the ability to be there. Yeah. But like it, I, my perspective is not enough mm. to to be on a select of three athletes running for the world title. I think, right. yeah, Philippe, Julian, Jordi, and then those guys they are they, they's burning on the belly now to one of that title. And I think Kelly at this stage doesn't have that kind of sense, you know, on. Do you, do you think that if he if he won an event or two events early in the season, then you know he gets a bit of blood on the fangs and he gets that burning back? I think I think he I think he'd be very happy to mm. be on that level, but I don't think he have the energy to fight into another title because it is an energy, man. It is you have to put all your all year on one thing. Yeah, you know, and then I think when he's starting to have brands buying a lot of things beside of him, uh, wave pool, uh, you know, when you have only one thing to do, it is win a world title. That make you you only have one option, you know. So when you have a lot of stuff next to you, yeah, definitely need his attention. Because mm-hmm. he's uh, the president of the, the company, you know. He yeah. needs to make some attitudes to make him the, if you go up and down, you know. So that make you out of the track, you know. Automatically, he, he, he don't want it, but he, he have to. That's a, that's a good point to finish on our, our rear view segment because it kind of transitions into what ended up happening for you this year. Now, after that heat, you go through to the quarterfinals, you go through the semifinals, you end up with Mick Fanning in the final, and you both tie <laughs> with 15 2 7. And uh, Mick got the nod because he had a higher single wave score. So, per the rules, he won with a count back. What were your thoughts at that point? Um, were you happy with the final, or were you no, like, how did I they tie? I was pissed. You know, I was <laughs> like, oh. But uh, the knowledge I make today, for me, it was amazing to losing to Mick on the final because mm-hmm. on uh, on the next event he went with the number one seed and uh, he took and uh, he took the draw of Jay Davis on the box, mm-hmm. make you even harder. You know, you have to be really like on the point, you know, to be the one of the local on that, in that type of wave, you know, and then, and then I took, uh, Ricardo Christie on, uh, on that day it was kind of like Sam, me and him on the same level, you know, and then when you have a local on that type of wave, make you even harder because you, you have, Mick already have a lot of pressure on his shoulder 
to be the local on that type wave, you know, so I don't. So that was kind of an advantage of my side. And I was kind of happy today to watch it make one day one event and put me down on the scene and then make my path to win Margaret was kind of like a different way. And then, and it's kind of like, I know never I will say easier because on the world to nothing easier. Yeah. But, um, but it definitely was kind of like uh, not the hardest way was Mickey was, you know, on that, yeah. on that part of the draw. So, and a lot of times it boils down to momentum too. You know, like you, you find parts of the tour where you have the momentum or someone else has the momentum or they have the hard wild card draw. And your relationship with Mick that year seemed to really intensify. You know, I remember a story that I believe you were at the airport when he was attacked in J Bay and you drove home or drove back yeah. to be with him. And then um, a few months later, after you won your world title, um, that he came to your celebration. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship with Mick that year? Yeah, it was we are very intense, definitely, because he he wanted the same space I I I want, you know. Mm. So, and also beside that, we have a Gabriel. He's starting doing really really good. Yeah, and then, but uh, when I when I lost on the quarterfinal against Julian on the, on the, on the Bay event. I say to my coach, let's go. I want to get out of this event and then starting thinking the next one now. Now, let's go. And then we say, okay, let's go to the airport. And then soon as we are on the way, it was kind of like make the plan to the next event. I'm like, man, we need to work on boards and then like make me distracted of about J Bay event, you know? Yeah. And then when we hit the airport, my wife called me like, you at the beach? Did you saw what happened? I was like, what happened first of all? <laughs> Cause I am in the airport now. She said, make almost die. I was like, what? That was like going to the next level. And then I forget totally about titles. I forgot totally about event. It was like save life, you know? Mm. That's when, when you have the level of life, I think nothing priority out about life, you know? So, and I decide to drive him back to see him personal. Mm-hmm. And then to see if he's alive, you know, he's fine, you know. So because on the way, I, I only see video, but uh, I don't yeah. see him well, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, I only see the shark almost bite him and then that's it. That's all world see only. You know, I, I, it was kind of like hard for, my, for myself to see that and say, no, I'm going home. Of course. So... And almost you, your friend and idol almost die, you know, like, yeah. man, 100 kilometers away only. So that's why I decided and see him personal. And then definitely make have us respect to everybody, especially with everybody was helping him around. But I think he was like, as well, see a different level when I see him support him on the hardest moment of his career. Yeah. And then that's, that's make, I think, him uh, more respect about myself because of that case. But, uh, but I don't think so only that case, you know. We have a respect because we, we, we respect each other and then we have a great relationship. During the year he was on a tour and then, and then I think respect we build in every day, not only one case, you know. So, um, yeah, that's it. So let's talk about a little bit about where you're at these days. I know we've touched on it. You know, your rookie year was 2005, 2020 is going to be, will be uh, ideally, your 16th year at the elite level. You've accomplished so much in your career, the world junior title. You've won a number of prestigious events. Uh, you paved the way for the Brazilian storm to even exist. And, and you won your own world title in 2015. 
when the championship tour turns back on and when we get back out there, what are your goals this year? I know we talked about, you know, building your confidence back and, and scoring eights and nines again. Is that the goal for this year? And then ultimately is the goal to make another run for a world title. Do you think that you have that in you? It will be all, it's all depends on about results. You know, mm-hmm. we, we are athletes. When we have a results, we have, we can dream of world titles. We can dream of top five. We can dream of top 10. That's, uh, that's a step, you know? And, um, I have a two events this year, two QSs, mm-hmm. make me really frustration because the the scores only I got on those those heats was only six six five, and um, that's why for me the prior prior of my time now it is let's get the scores, let's make the on uh, that kind of levels again you know and then that was for me the all attention of my preparation it is on that on focus on that you know and then and i i believe who is on uh, on the run with the rhythm and then fighting hunting for the world title they are on uh, on the front of myself of course mm-hmm. But um, but I think uh, I need to build in first of all those things in my mind back on uh, get on great scores again, and then as soon as you get the scores, also the results, and then the results we can talking about, and then energy to be on uh, on the world title hunting again. But first of all, I'm very happy every single thing I earning and I got on the world tour, and uh, and definitely for athletes who is uh, champion, everybody wanted to see. Oh, let's see the world champion surfing right now. You know, that's kind of like the pressure for me. It is the highest in anything at this stage. You know, because I wanted get a great scores again, you know, that make me feel great again. That's my, my main goal right now. Well, it's been an amazing career. So, and it's, it's, uh, it's not over. Um, <laughs> and neither is this podcast. Before we finish, we've got two more segments. Uh, the first okay. one is a quick one. It's called the pandemic survival kit. So a couple okay. questions about what you're, how you're surviving in quarantine and what, how, what tips you can offer people. So the first one is, what food have you found that you're eating more than you thought you would in quarantine? Yeah, that's one of the <laughs> the thing I'm very focused. It is to not fall on a diet <laughs> because it's so easy, so easy to to fall on a diet because uh, I am at home right now. My wife, she's not on diet. And she bring a lot of great stuff to home. <laughs> good snacks, yeah. Good snacks and then chocolates and then everything. She makes a cake and then and she make a lot of pressure on hey, eat it, just a bite, just a bite, just try it. But yeah. <laughs> never, never will you will uh, uh, reduce your diet. So just just a bite. I say no. <laughs> if you take a bite, I will take a big, big pie, a big bite, and then it's a it's a long process. Yep. So I not even I don't want to even touch, you know. So and I just trying to get the routine, you know. So even in a home, uh, when I, it's all over, I have a different routine. But now my routine it is I just wake up and then have my tea and do my exercise in the morning. And then right away I do some stuff at home and just clean my, my living room and organizing the, the, the kitchen and, <laughs> and then also cooking my own food. So I, I, I cook my own food so I know exactly 
I need to eat and then to at the end of the day I have another session of training. So and everything I eat I need I need right away after, you know? like in, right. in three so two hours. Good schedule regimen. Schedule. Here. I'm like your wife. I just I just go to the fridge. I've been I've been <laughs> eating like this like it's the so Shobani easy. yogurts. I, I can't yeah. complain. It's yeah, so yeah, easy. It's easy. I, I, those um, I've been eating way more of those little Shobani yogurts with like the toppings. I'm sure there's like healthy version, but I get like the Oreo cookie one where I put it in there and I'm like, it's yogurt's fine, but it's basically ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Se- second question is uh, feed your mind. What book recommendation do you have for people? You've been reading anything uh, good in books? Um, I'm not a book um, fan. But um, but I, I wanted so hard like uh, to have to read the autobiography of Yogi. Okay. And uh, I wanted so bad to read this book. I mean, I ordered online, and uh, I thought it was in Portuguese and arrived in English. Oh. oh. <laughs> and it is a, such a thick book, like right. a thick. <laughs> I say so no, a no, lot no, of work. No, no. no, a lot of work. <laughs> I've been uh, I've been then, reading uh, this uh, Pima Chodron, the places that scare you. I don't know if it comes in Portuguese. It's pretty good. It's good. It's good. It's good for right now. Clear. It clears my mind. But um, I you, but I use I use a lot of YouTube. So and uh, I I I'm patient in about the marketing salt market. Mm. And uh, and uh, when I have a free time, I'm uh, watching the marketing and uh, analyzing and and buy some stock and sell some stock and, and you know this kind of process. Businessman. All right. Well, yeah, before we go, a business, we... but I'm just like <laughs> having some thing to do. You know. Yeah. Co- yeah. Of course. Well, before we go, we got one more segment. It's called the lightning round. Um, okay. These are ten questions. You answer as fast as you can. If you could have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Trust it. Coffee or tea? Tea. Burrito or pizza? No. <laughs> Any. Last book you read? Um, it was about the prison, um, City of God. Oh, yeah. Um, best surf film ever. Best surf video, surf film. Yeah. Um, I have a few. You got to pick the best one. But uh, I think John John was the best. The view of blue, right? Yep, view of a blue moon. That's a good one. One wave you never have to go back to. I I know people will be sad. If I say if I say that, but uh, I I don't want to never ever come back to New Key in England. <laughs> okay, if you it's, only got to surf one wave for the rest of your life, which wave would it be? At home. Yeah, best my home person. Break. Best person to share a lineup with. Um, Jadson. Worst person to share a lineup with. Joe. <laughs> Last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. Say again. Uh, finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. <sighs> Getting back in the water. <laughs> um. I think um, this coronavirus, man. Yeah, when that's over. over. I, that's, I, I hope this is over and it, I don't have, we don't have no much death. Yeah. I think uh, that would make me really amazed and happy. Yeah, well, that's a great answer. Well, Adriana D'Souza, 2015 world champion amazing human being thank you so much for joining us on the lineup today, and man. uh i, I just want to say dan i know joe is gonna be frustrating what i say 
But I like, I have to pick someone, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's going to argue. He probably knows he's a pest. <laughs> All right, man. You stay safe. Right. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Cheers. Bye. See you, dude. So that's it. That is the lineup at Low Tide's conversation with Adriana D'Souza. What a human being. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. The lineup will return with these conversations every week. Please have a listen and let us know what you think. And the lineup has an Instagram page now. So if you want some behind the scenes stuff and stay up to date with who's coming on the pod, give us a follow. We are at the lineup pod, all one word. You can also follow me on Instagram at Dave Prodan. We'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of The Lineup at Low Tide. I hope you safely get some waves wherever you're at, and we'll see you then. Do you like that? Well, if so, subscribe over there, and then watch more videos over there. And then tell us your favorite videos down there. It's a three-step process. Do them all now.